Welcome back my statics friends. In the last video we started talking about Cartesian vector components and how we could use those to construct or deconstruct vectors into either a resultant or into their subcomponents. In this video I'm going to show you how we can put that to use for systems of forces. Okay it's the same idea but we're building up on what we've done in the previous videos. So without further ado let's get started. All right, so welcome back. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how do we handle multiple vectors in space. Now, in the previous videos, you may have noticed that the focus quality was a little bit off. I'm going to try pulling the camera out a little bit more, and hopefully it will make things a little bit crisper and a little bit more clear. I think I was zoomed in just a little bit too much, so I apologize for the, the video quality. Hopefully this will rectify the situation. It already looks quite a bit better now. So um, as always, the, the notes for these lessons are available on the website, and so you can go pull those down and kind of play along at home. It's not my intent for you to have to copy everything that I'm talking about here, though you're welcome to, but more to make notes about things that are discussed or ideas or concepts directly on those packets is the way that I would intend for this to work out. But if you want to copy it, hopefully the clarity of this video will help you to be able to do that. Now, one of the things that we were talking about a couple of videos ago was finding resultants of systems of two forces. Okay, and so I posed the question to you, well, how do you find the resultant of more than two vectors? Okay, now, if we're doing the parallelogram method or the triangle law or any of those methods, the obvious answer would be, okay, well, I could take two vectors and find the resultant of that, and then take that resultant to the third vector and find the resultant of that, and then take that vector resultant and find and so forth and repeat this thing ad nauseum, if you will, okay? You could keep repeating. and. While that's a completely valid way to do it, it's mathematically intensive, and there's a definite better way to do this. So the lesson that I'm going to kind of point out to you, and we talked about this in the, in the previous video, is, is that if you see a system of more than two forces, or a system of forces that is in three-dimensional space with an X, Y, and a Z component, your mind should automatically be going, this is a vector addition problem, I should be doing this with vectors. Okay, don't try to do parallelogram law. Now, inherently, Every year that I've taught this, there have been students that have tried to take, you know, a, you know on a quiz or a test, a, a problem involving four or five forces and try to resolve that using the parallelogram method. And I think in the 22, 23 times I've taught this class, I think one person got through it successfully. It's very intensive on the mathematics. So if you're very good at math, feel free. I'm not that good at it. So my, my suggestion is don't discount this method uh, for vectors. Vectors are very useful. You know, it will help you in your future dynamic classes. It will help you in physics. And of course, it will help you in all of your calculus curriculum as well. So anyway, I will now get off my soapbox. But just this is, this is worth the time to, to watch this video a time or two to make sure that you understand it. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to our Cartesian vector notation. And if you don't remember what that is, take a look at the previous video and we'll kind of look at this. And so what I have is I have an x-axis here and I have a y-axis here. Okay. And then I've got three forces, F1 as a vector, F2 as a vector, and F3 as a vector. Okay. And if we recall kind of our basic vector addition uh, notation was, is that I can define a vector f as being his x component scalar quantity times i uh, the i unit vector plus his y component times the j unit vector plus his z component times the k unit vector okay and so this is i can do this for every one of these forces okay now the thing that's cool about this is that if i kind of look at this this is in two dimensions so obviously there's no z component okay but if i look at the coplanar force resultants meaning that there's no k component and by coplanar, I mean the xy plane on that. Okay, that what I can do is I can look at my force F1, which was this guy, and say, well, that's got some piece of him in the x direction. And so his component would be acting this way. That's a positive x, so it's going to be F1x times i. Remember, these magnitudes are always positive quantities. Okay, but I do have to get the signs right for the unit vectors. Likewise, for F1, his vertical component along the y-axis is acting up, so that's a positive j. So the 1x magnitude times i plus the 1y magnitude times j gets me this. Okay, if I go look at vector 2, which is this guy, now we're looking at what's happening here, and his component is acting to the right in the x-direction, 
So if positive i goes towards positive x, then this is a negative i. So for two, it's gonna be a minus f2x times i, okay? And then his vertical component is this guy, okay? Again, all I'm doing is constructing the parallelograms or the rectangles because it's Cartesian that make this up, and his piece acting up in the y direction is gonna be a positive j vector, so that's why it's a positive. And then if I go look at F3, well, his X component comes over to the right. That's a positive I, so F3X times I. And then his negative component, or his Y component is negative because it's pointing toward the negative direction. Remember, positive J is up. This is a negative J. So it's a minus F3Y times J. The hardest part of this whole process is getting these positive negative signs right. Okay, once I have that done, I've constructed these vectors. Now I can go very easily find the resultant. Okay, so I'm going to define my vector resultant FR of this system of vectors as being F1 plus F2 plus F3. Okay, and so you see that I have all of this I stuff and all of this J stuff. Well, vector addition says that you can add numerically all of the I stuff together. So this is going to, you know, so what I've done is I basically I transcribed all three of these lines into this one real long algebra equation. Okay, and then I've collected terms. And so what happens is I get f1x minus f2x plus f3x times i, that's the sum of all of these things, okay, plus f1y plus f2y minus f3y is all of the j stuff. And if you look at what happens is all the i stuff that collects together, every single one of these had an x component in it. And likewise, the j stuff, every single one of these had a y component in it, all right? And so what we can do is we can collect all of these things together and say, well, if this is my fr vector, and then all of this fr in the x direction stuff is i, so this is the magnitude of the x component, is the sum of all of these little subcomponents, okay? And then the magnitude for fry is gonna be the sum of all of the y subcomponents, okay? And so if I go through and I do that, well, this was the same thing as saying frx plus fry. Okay, and so we can kind of go back to that basic vector addition formula to get us to here. Now, all I'm doing is I'm kind of playing with what's happening inside of these little terms based off of the way that I built this expression. Well, if we think more generically, well, let's look at frx. That was f1x minus f2x plus f3x. Well, in a nutshell, what you've done is you've done the sum of all of the xi components. Okay, so we've summed all the forces in the xi direction. Okay, and then FRY, we've taken and summed all the Y stuff. Now again, some are positive, some are negative, that doesn't matter. You're still just simply summing all of those guys with their positives and negatives on there. And so the FRX is equal to the sum of all the forces in the X. And the FRY is equal to the sum of all the forces in the Y. And as you might suspect, an FRZ is equal to the sum of all the forces in the Z direction. That they, they all break down that, direct, that way. Okay, so really, really easy, but it's very, very powerful what you can do. Because once I get to this, now I can go in and say, well, what's the magnitude of FR? You know, we've got our vector. The magnitude of FR is the sum of the square root of FRx squared plus FRy squared, and whatever that value ends up being. That will get us to our frx and our fry, okay? And then from that, I can go in and say, well, what was his direction? Well, I can do the math, and since you have the fr vector, and you now have the magnitude of fr, you can now tell me the direction of him with i, j, and k um, component vectors, unit vectors tied into it. Very, very easy to go through and add and subtract and put these things together and to break them apart. Very, very powerful technique. This will show up on your first test and it will probably show up on one of your quizzes. So make sure that you understand the math that's going. It's very simple steps. It comes down to some very basic formulas, you know, the most important of which is, is that an F vector is equal to a magnitude of an F vector dotted into a unit vector in the F direction. That formula is huge. I would put a note by this and say, I need to know that, okay? Because that one you come back to over and over. Because everything we've done is a manipulation of that formula, okay? We're just kind of doing it in more pieces and more, okay? Now, the thing that's really cool about this method is, is that, you know, the approach is exactly the same. To find F1, 
all I have to worry about is F1. I could ignore everything else and just look at him by himself and construct F, or sorry, that was F2. F2, and then F1, do only F1, and F3, only F3. That's all you've done. It's completely independent of anything else that's going on. Now, what will happen when we get into chapter four and start trying to find equilibrium is, is that maybe there will be times that I don't know what these values are, they're numerical values, but I do know they're there and I do know the direction that if I start forcing equilibrium, on this, which means that everything is balanced and the resultant is zero, it's a special case we'll talk about, that I can now quickly start solving for these unknowns. And that becomes a major, major uh, game changer in the world of uh, static solutions. And we'll use that over and over as we get into um, solving for structural systems later on in the, in the, in the course series. So anyway, I hope that's kind of made some sense to you. All right, so here's what we're going to get. So kind of to kind of summarize what it is that we've done, if we consider forces in space, then all I've done is said, well, what's the net resultant of the sum of all of these force vectors? So again, all I've done is F1 vector plus F2 vector plus F3 vector plus, and I can put as many of these guys on there as I want. Okay, that that gets me the resultant. Okay, and at the end of the day, when I collect all the IJK stuff, that this is going to be equal to the x component times i plus the y component times j plus the z component times k, right? And that that's going to then be the sum of all of these vector pieces together. And so this is going to be the sum of fx times i plus the sum of fy times j plus the sum of fz times k. And then with that, you get the resultant. And with that, I can now pull direction cosines and so forth and so on. Okay, but this is the net resultant. Okay, now in statics, we talked about, you know, um, Newton's second law that said force vector was equal to mass times acceleration vector, but we prescribed that a vector had to be zero. Well, that tells me then that this would be a zero vector in a static world. Okay, well, all we're going to do then for equilibrium is project this out and say, well, the net resultant of a system of forces on an object has to be equal to a zero vector. And when you see zero with a hat, that's just zero i plus zero j plus zero k. That's my r vector. Well, then by that logic, everything in front of the i is the sum of forces x, and everything in front of the j is sum of forces y, and everything in front of the k is sum of forces z. Okay, well, in order to get this criteria, this has to be true that the sum of the forces in the x has to be equal to zero, the sum of forces in the y has to be equal to zero, and the sum of the forces in the z have to be zero in order for an object to be in equilibrium. Okay, these three rules together are what we call translational equilibrium. Okay, and we call it translational because we know that forces cause motion or displacement in a given direction. So unless the force is zero in that given direction, there will be a motion or a displacement that occurs. Okay, now, to fully define equilibrium, it's not only translational, there is another component that has to do with rotational. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in a day or two. Okay, but that's the basics of what forces and spaces are trying to do for us, okay? All right, so let's give one a try and kind of take a look at what we're doing here. Okay, and so we've got a Cartesian vector representation. If we look at, at this, it's exactly what we just outlined, all these same rules. Here's my vector resultant, x times i, y times j, z times k. We'll go fairly quickly through this because you've seen it. The magnitude then is just the square of, or the sum of the squares square rooted. So that's this formula, the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. Okay, and then I can find the direction uh, of the Cartesian vector that, of the resultant of the three of these as then being fx over f, fy over f, and fz over f. And this gets me the direction cosines, alpha, beta, gamma that we talked about in the last video. Okay, and then from that I can compute the unit vectors. Okay, or well, we've kind of done it here anyway, but you can see that the unit vector we know is the magnitude of f over, or sorry, the vector f over the magnitude of f and that's fx over f, fy over f, fz over f. So remember we talked about the direction cosines. Well, that term is cosine alpha. This term is cosine beta, and that term is cosine gamma. So this is that direction cosine, just written a little bit differently. Okay, so you can write it any number of ways that you want. Sometimes, you know, if you have a problem where they give you the directions as angles, this guy is a whole lot easier than trying to resolve things into forces to get the unit vector. Okay, now we know that the unit vector is one, 
okay, or the magnitude of the unit vector is one. Well, if you look at what happens, then another law comes out or another relationship that says, well, magnitudes of a vector are the squares of all the i, j, k's. So I could do cosine squared alpha plus cosine squared beta plus co cosine squared gamma is equal to what would be one squared, but that's just one, okay? So you'll see this relationship as well. So if I have two of the angles, I can get the third as a relationship of that, okay? So this is the general kind of in a nutshell procedure for what it is that we're doing with vectors. You're gonna come around through these formulas over and over and over again as you try to kind of look at um, doing some of these basic vector operations. All right, so let's try one. Got an example down here at the bottom, okay? And so what I've done is I've set up you know, a couple of vectors. Now again, this is three-dimensional because everything's got an i, j, k. Um, so my f2 vector is 50i minus 100j plus 100k. My f1 vector is 60j plus 80k. Now notice there's no i, so that means that it lives in the yz plane, okay? That it doesn't come out at all. This vector, you know, if I say that it starts out at 0, 0 and comes out, that that's its vector. It's got an i component positive 50. It's got a j component minus 100 and then it's got a z component upwards positive 100 so that's what it was seeing and so to help me illustrate this in three dimensions you'll see that i draw these dotted lines and typically so that means that this point is out in space directly over a point in the xy plane okay and so that's what whereas this one it's over the axis because there was no i component this visually it kind of helps me to see stuff all right so we want to find the magnitude and the direction and angles of the resultant of this vector well, it's really easy because I've already given you the i, j, k form of this. So all we do is run through the steps. Find the resultant, that's the sum of all of the force vectors, okay? Which in this case, there's f1 vector plus f2. So I'm gonna plug in 60j plus 80k, and then plus 50i minus 100j plus 100k, and I'm gonna do my math. And if I do all of my math, I get a 50i minus 40j plus 180k is the vector that represents the resultant of those two guys. Now, what happens is, is that if you imagine a cube that contains all of these, this would be the diagonal that comes out across that. So this resultant is kind of happening out in the middle between, somewhere between F1 and F2 on a cube, you know, which is a three-dimensional parallelogram. I guess it's not a cube, but a, a rectangular prism, if you will, the opposite diagonal of that. Okay, and then from X to FR is alpha, from Y to FR is beta, and from Z to FR is what we're calling as gamma. Those are those direction cosines that we talked about. All right, so once I have the vector, I can find the magnitude. That's 50 squared plus a minus 40 squared plus 180 squared, and then I take the square root. FR is 191 pounds. Okay, and so now I have the magnitude of that force. Now, this is not a vector by itself, because remember, I need the magnitude, which is what this guy is. So I can put this guy on here and put a hat and my magnitude operator, okay? But to get, his ve to, to get the, I need something that tells me his sense and his direction, and that's what that unit vector does, all right? So I can construct the unit vector by simply taking FR and dividing it by the magnitude of FR. Okay, which is all I'm doing. So again, it's that same formula over and over and over. I go through these same steps repeatedly. It's this guy up here. Okay, and so if I do that, then I can do the math. I can say, well, I can take 50 over 191 times I minus 40 over 191 times J. Now notice there is a minus sign on this one. Okay, and then plus 180 over 191 times K. And if I resolve that down to decimals, I can write the unit vector as a series of decimals, 0.2617i minus 0.2091j plus 0.942 times k. Okay, all I did was just did the math and simplify that. Now again, I'm carrying four decimal places here. You really only need about three for accuracy. And if I check the unit vector calculation on this, if I squared this and squared this and squared this, added them together and did the square root, which was you know, an operation that looks something kind of like this guy, okay, that all of this would sum to something like 0 0.9999999. It's basically 1.0. There'll be a little bit of a difference because of round off error and, you know, irrational numbers, you know, you have to truncate or round or whatever the case may be, but it works and you can check that math on your own. Okay, so once I have those quantities, I can say, well, the cosine of alpha is that number. That tells me the alpha is 74.8 degrees from X cosine of beta is this number. And so if I take the inverse cosine, then beta is 102. Okay. Now it's greater than 90 degrees because that J component was a negative direction. 
So again, positive j is to the right here, but we know this vector is pointing back and to the left because of the negative sign that was in my vector, this minus 40. So that tells me that his y component has to be pushing to the left, which is a negative j, and that's why it's greater than 90 degrees. Okay, and then cosine of gamma is the last term, 0 0.9422, and gamma is now 19.6 degrees on that. And so that's how you can work through all of these and get directions and resultants and magnitudes and, you know, by playing with components. And it's super easy with vectors. In fact, if you see a vector problem on a test or a quiz, man, these are free points if you know just these simple steps as you start to kind of go through on that. So anyway, that's kind of what we can do with forces in space. It's just as simple as just doing a little bit of vector addition again. Nothing too, too challenging, really, as far as that goes. So anyway, I hope that's made sense to you. Um, a shorter video this time. So um, if you've got any questions or comments, please leave those down below in the comment section down below. Um, otherwise, uh, toss us a like or subscribe to the channel, and we will see you guys next time. Have a great afternoon. Happy engineering.